All right, the last chapter of the book of Genesis, chapter number 50. Finally coming to an end here. We, um, we start off the chapter. It says, And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. Now, of course, he's doing that because it's a continuation from chapter 49. And at the end of chapter 49, remember chapter 49, he blessed all of his children, and then he died. He put his feet up into his bed, and he gave up the ghost. And he died. And so, of course, you know, when the Bible is written, it's not divide, it was never divided up into chapters. That came a little bit later. So when this was written down, it was, it's all just one story. So, obviously, I don't think there's anything wrong with breaking up the Bible into chapters. It helps us to, to, to memorize. It helps us to just to talk about it and refer to different sections and stuff. No problem with that. But as we're reading here, you know, we go a week apart from time to time. That's why I always like to recap what's going on. Jacob had made an end of, of um, blessing his children and commanding them, and then he gave up the ghost and he died. So we're picking up right here at that same event of, of, of Jacob dying. So obviously when somebody dies, it's a sad event. And we're going to see that. There's this great mourning that's, held, that's, that's kept for, for Jacob and his death because he was a very great man. He had a lot of respect. A lot of people knew him. You remember when, um, when Pharaoh met Israel and Israel blessed Pharaoh. It, you know, Pharaoh wanted to meet him. He, he was a man he had a lot of respect for. Pharaoh had a lot of respect for Joseph. But imagine just, you know, getting the chance to meet his father. You know, his father did something right. He raised Joseph right. And, and he wanted to meet that man. And Israel had, had a lot of experience. He was an old man. He, he had done a lot of things in his life. He had gone through a lot of different stuff. He had a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience. And obviously a lot of people cared for him and loved him, which is why they had such a great grieving for him. Now, I'm going to deal with basically this subject of death and how we deal with it, and, and the grief that we go through, and the grieving process. And, and basically, you know, grieving is a normal part of losing a loved one. And I just want to show you that, for one, you know, you, especially for the guys, you, know, you don't have to be a tough guy. You can weep, and, and, and it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. When you lose somebody in your life, like a mother or father, brother or sister, someone close to you, um, we see here that, that Joseph, he falls upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. It's an emotional time when somebody passes away. And even, even when somebody who's saved, you know, Jacob was saved. And Joseph knew that. And Joseph knew he was going to see him again. We still have sadness. It's still sad when somebody departs from you. When you know you're not going to see, you know, you know you're, the, the comfort we have, and I'm going to get to that a little later, you know, you know you can have the comfort of seeing them again. And that's, that's the good news. But even at least for the short term, though, you know you're not going to see that person again. And that's why some, you know, it's, it's such a sad event because when somebody passes on, you, have this, you come to this realization, I'm not going to see this person anymore. You know, I'm not going to... I'm not going to be able to talk to them on the phone. I'm not going to be able to see them. We're not going to see them at family gatherings. They're just not going to be there anymore. And it's kind of weird. And it's sad. That, that finality of death is, is a sad thing that happens. It's, the, you know, it's that separation. And you know, it's a real part. And, and it's something that, that it is. Obviously, it's a part of life. And it's every, something everyone has to deal with. But we need to keep it in our minds also because it is a reason to... Talk to people, especially people who aren't saved about the gospel. We never know when our day is going to come. You know, everybody seems to have it in their mind, myself included, that you're going to make it to like, like Israel did. You know, a really old man, and you're going to know it's just like your time to go, and you've lived this really long life. This is the image, this is the picture that everybody has in their mind of dying. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna be real old one day, and I'm gonna be you know laying on my deathbed, and I'm just gonna pass away. And hey, that's great. You know, would to God that would happen to us all, but that's not what happens to everybody. There's accidents. There's things that happen. You know, people die in, in car accidents. We have a friend that died in a motorcycle accident who was my age just a, a couple years ago, and it's extremely sad. And these events happen, and we never know when what hour it is that we are gonna breathe our last breath. And we never know when other people are going to breathe their last breath, which is all the more important. You know, we go through death and we, we, we realize this, there's this great separation and there's going to be a time when you are not going to see a person ever again, possibly, or if not for a very, very long time. And what we do in this life matters. And so if someone is saved and you're going to see them again one day, hey, that's great and you can take comfort in that, but 
you know, the, what they're going to do in this life, you know, their life, it, once it ends here, that's it. You know, what they've believed, what they put their faith in for salvation, that's over the moment you die. The amount of work that you've done for Christ, the moment you breathe like this, that's, that's it. You know, I mean, you, the amount of rewards that you could earn, the thing, you know, the way, the, the influence you could have on other people's life, hey, that ends the moment you breathe the last breath here. The life here that we have, it, it, it may be a short time, but it's very important how we use that time. And when we look at, at death as a natural part of life, it's, it's a time to reflect on that and reflect on what we're doing with our life. And let's say you do make it to that last point and, and make it to be an old man or an old lady and you're on your deathbed. How are you going to look back on your life, on what you've done? Are you going to be pleased? Are you going to be satisfied? Are you going to say, you know, I'm, now I just can't wait for God to greet me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because I've served him with my whole life. Because I've, I've done all of this for him. Because, because I've reached so many people. I've reached my family. I've reached my friends. I've reached strangers. I've, you know, I've reached so many people with the gospel that I feel like I did a pretty good job. Now, nobody's perfect, but at least you can look back and say, you know what? I did a lot of work for God. And I'm content with what I've done in my life. Everyone, I think, will always say I could have done more. But we want to make it to the to that end. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 16.31, the hoary head, hoary just means like a white or gray. It's a, it's a light color. The hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. So making it to be an old person, and this is, you know, just from that verse, you know, a lot of people want to make themselves look young. You know, people start to get older and they start to get gray hairs. And what do they do? They always try to dye their hair and make themselves look young. I will never, Mark, I will never do that. Never do that. And I don't want my wife to ever do that either because the Bible says the hoary head is a crown of glory. Hey, that's a good thing. That is a crown of glory that you have on your head if it be found in the way of righteousness. If you've lived a, a, a relatively righteous life, then praise God for that and, and your old age is a crown of glory. That's something not to be ashamed of or something to try to hide or make yourself look young. No, there's no reason to make yourself look young. Now, of course, we live in a culture where people don't give the proper respect unto their elders, but they ought to. We were out soul winning today, and we talked to a man who was in his 70s, and he was talking about how much things have changed. He said when he was a kid, he was a younger kid in the 50s and a teenager in the 60s, and he said, he's just saying how much different things. Things are way different now. There's much more morality then. There's a lot of things that are different now. And you know, back in those days, people had a lot more respect for their elders. And when somebody that was older was speaking, just like in the days of Job, remember, there was um, Job's three friends, and then, and then the, other, the younger guy, he said, I waited because you're all older than me. And he had that respect to listen to his elders and to try to gain wisdom for them before he decided to open up his mouth and give his opinion. And you know, that's the way that it ought to be. We ought to have that type of respect for our elders and, and be able to listen to them and give place for them to speak and, and learn something from their experience and their knowledge and their wisdom. Because the more things that you go through, the more things you learn. You learn more about life. Even from people who aren't necessarily, you know, the best Christians, you still, someone who's been around for a long time, you, you gain wisdom. You know, maybe people have gained it the hard way over many years. You still gain knowledge. And, uh, you know, hopefully you don't have to learn things the hard way. But either way, you know, we should be able to listen. And especially those that have lived the righteous life, that have lived a Christian life for a long time and they're older, you will find a lot to learn from people like that. And that, that hoary head is a crown of glory unto people like that. And I believe that's how Jacob was. You know, he was an old man. He must have had a hoary head at that point in his life before, before he died. He lived to be, you know, over 100 years old. And um, I believe his, his life was found in the way of righteousness. Of course, he had his problems and his mistakes, but... But ultimately, we see he was a man of faith, and he was a man that, that did what God wanted him to do. Now, keep your finger here in Genesis 50. I want you to turn to John chapter 11. We see here with, you know, with Joseph weeping and, and kissing his father after he's, he's departed from him. I just want to point out about, about grieving that even though, especially for men, it's not, it's not a manly thing to weep or to cry, but 
in a time of, of death, I mean, you, you ought to feel, there, there ought to be that sorrow there, and, and weeping is fine. Even, you know, we're turning to, to John chapter 11, this is the section where Jesus weeps. Okay, he doesn't do it very much. It's not like he's a crybaby. He's not just crying all the time. But there are times when, you know, even Jesus Christ himself wept. And it was another, in this instance, it's a time when Lazarus had died. And even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead, it was still a sad time. The, a, a time of death is a sad time in our lives. Let's start reading in verse number 31. The Bible reads, The Jews then which were with her at, in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come out where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. That bothered Jesus. I mean, this is, this is God incarnate in the flesh, Jesus Christ himself, fully God yet fully man, having these emotions during this time, seeing how much people are grieving over their friend Lazarus, over their loved one that has passed on, and having Mary come out and say, Lord, you know, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. And, and that hits home with him, and his spirit is just is troubled inside of him. He's groaning. And it says in verse 34, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see and of course, verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus grieved. He had sorrow. Jesus wept. He shed tears for the loss of Lazarus and for, and for the impact that it has on so many lives. When someone dies, obviously it impacts the whole family. It impacts all of your loved ones. Everyone is sad for that event. Verse number 36, then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. Jesus, and Jesus did love him. Jesus loved Mary. He loved Martha. He loved Lazarus. They were his close friends. He had a lot of love for Lazarus so much, I mean, he wept for him. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that was, that was a, the normal part of grieving for even Jesus Christ to do that. Verse 37, And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? So now again, when people are saying, you know, Mary had just confirmed and said, Look, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I wish you could have just been here for that. And now the other people are standing there saying, look, he was performing these miracles. He made the blind receive their sight. If he could have been here, couldn't he have made it so that he was healed and so he wouldn't have died? Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. That bothered him to hear that there was something that he could have done. And hearing that from them, and it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And then, of course, well, I'm not going to read the rest of the story, but we see that, that he does perform his miracle and he, and, and he calls Lazarus forth and Lazarus comes out of the grave. And, and what a, an amazing event that is. You know, and he, turns, he turns their grief into happiness. And this is the picture of the resurrection. And see, this is why we don't have to just have grief when someone dies, especially someone, well, when someone's saved, when someone is a believer that dies. That just as much as this picture shows the, the severe grief and the weeping and the sorrow over someone who's passed away, then you see the joy that happens when he's brought forth out of the grave and he's resurrected. And, and what an, an amazing event. And everyone, you know, everybody's sadness and grief turns into joy and happiness in, in an instant because he's, he's come forth out of the grave. And that's what we are going to face in the res with the resurrection. Now, we have nothing to fear in death. You're in John. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 2. Flip over to Hebrews chapter number 2. A lot of people are afraid of death. A lot of people are afraid to, to come to that point in their life. And, you know, if you're not saved, if you don't know Christ, I can understand why you'd be afraid. I would be afraid too. Because most people are thinking, man, I don't know if I did it. I don't know if I'm making it to heaven. I don't know what's going to happen to me when I die. And it's a scary thought to think, what is going to happen when, when I breathe my last breath? Am I, am I going to wind up in hell? Am I going to be tortured and tormented? What's going to happen? People can get really scared when they see death coming on the horizon. When, when they know their time is coming to an end. 
But we as believers, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to have that same fear because we have confidence. We have confidence in our Savior. We know that He's bought us. We know where our soul is headed. We know where we're going when we die. Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse 14. The Bible says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also Himself likewise took part of the same, that through death He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus Christ defeated death. He defeated the devil. He defeated, you know, it says here, him that had the power of death and delivered us, delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We we're subject to sin and bondage and, and the end of death and hell. But he's delivered us from that. He saved us from that through his death on the cross, obviously. Psalm 23, I'll just read it for you. Real famous psalm is, is read most commonly at funerals and, and uh, you know, when pe someone passes on because it's, it's a psalm that gives encouragement. It's a psalm that, that gives edification and comfort unto those when they have someone who's passed away. They're words that can help you through a time of grief and sorrow. Psalm 23, verse 1, the Bible reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. So he's talking about God being my shepherd. He's watching over me. He's leading me where I go through this life. When people die in our life, hey look, we can take comfort in the fact that God is leading us. He is our shepherd. He's watching us. He's leading us in the path of righteousness. We don't have to let these events just, just bring us down into a state of grief that is just over much grief and sorrow that will just drown us in our sorrows. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. It's an eternal thing. When we, when we pass on, we're going to dwell in God's house forever. And that's comforting. That's good news. And that's, that's one of the main reasons why this psalm is read at, at funerals and stuff. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to see another, another famous passage that is often used to comfort and, and the comfort that we could find in death is, is ultimately found in the resurrection of the dead because people don't stay dead. When you die physically, you don't stay dead. I mean, we know we have a soul and a spirit that continues on anyways with eternal life. But even our body isn't going to stay in that ground. 1 Thessalonians 4, look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He's saying, I don't want you to, to misunderstand this. Those that are asleep, those that, he's talking about people who have died. People who have passed on, saved believers that, that, have, that have died. He says that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. You know, we don't need, as believers, we don't need to sorrow the way that, that unbelievers sorrow when someone passes away. Because oftentimes that is, that is a permanent separation. When an unbeliever dies, you are, you are going to be separated from that person forever. Even if another person is an unbeliever. I mean, yeah, you may both be in hell, but you're not going to be together comforting each other. Everyone in hell is going to be burning and tortured. Torment. There's no comfort there. You're not going to be comforted by the fact that one of your loved ones is burning and being tortured with you. That's terrible. I mean, think about that. Think about if someone, I mean, you, you hear about these horrible crimes and stuff that happen. If someone were to come into your house and, and tie you up and tie your whole family up, wouldn't you rather, if something like that were to happen, wouldn't you rather it just happened to you and that you were the only one getting tortured by some sicko and not that your entire family was being suffered also? I mean, do you think that's going to make you feel better that your, your children and your wife and these other people are all getting tortured by some madman that's broken in your house? No, of course not. You would hate for that to happen. That would make you feel even worse. 
So there is no comfort in hell. Those that have no hope, there's no comfort. When someone else dies that's an unbeliever, it's going to be even worse for them to find out you didn't get saved, you're being tortured and tormented also. That's horrible. There's no comfort there. But see, we, we don't have to have that type of a sorrow that the unbeliever has of, of, of never seeing their, their loved one again. Because we do have hope. He says in verse 14, he's going to explain why we don't have to sorrow that way. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So saying, if, we, if you believe that Christ rose from the dead, if you believe in his resurrection, which you have to in order to be saved, do you believe in the resurrection of Christ? Don't worry, because that's just a foreshadowing, because we're all going to be resurrected. God's going to raise us all from the dead. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a great source of comfort, knowing that once your loved one has passed on, he's saying, don't worry. You don't have to be so sad about them that, that have passed on and have died now because you know that Christ resurrected from, resurrected from the dead. You know that we also, when he comes back, those that are asleep, we're not even going to go before them. If you're alive when Jesus comes back, all, all the believers in Christ that have died before you, hey, they're going to come up out of the grave. And they're going to meet the Lord together in the air with us. We're all going to go up together. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going to be with Him forever. We're going to be with our loved ones forever. Praise God for that. That is hope. There is comfort in that. We could have that hope that, yeah, we may, we may be separated for temporarily from our loved one that's a believer, but we will be reunited with them when Christ comes back. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First, this entire chapter goes about, talks about the resurrection of Christ and really outlines it. And we're in a, I'm going to try to, to jump through this kind of quickly. And, you know, the reason why I'm going so in-depth in this is because so far we've seen, you know, and there's not a whole lot going on in chapter 50. There's... Um, the death of Israel, and then also at the end, the death of Joseph, right? And there's a few other things in between. I'll get to those also. But half of the chapter is, is spent dealing with the mourning, the grieving, the lamentation that goes on, the burying of, of Jacob in his, in his tomb that he purchased with, uh, where, where Abraham and Isaac were also buried. He goes and buries that. And, you know, it's also interesting in the chapter, I noticed it said that... Um, they buried him in a place where, where he dug his grave, where Jacob dug his grave already. He prepared everything. Abraham had his burying place figured out and all prepared. You know, Isaac did, and Jacob also. He had his grave dug and ready to go. And showing that, you know, we should be, get as much plans as possible so that, you know, other people, you don't lay a burden on them when you pass away, right? I mean, they had the plot ready to go. They had everything laid out and ready to go and say, this is what I want you to do with me. They had their will laid out and said, this is what I want you to do. You know, obviously, you could, that's all you can do because, I mean, it's going to be up to them to actually respect your wishes and respect your will. But I, I, I believe that, we, you know, that's why there's living wills. That's why we have things that are, that, that, um, you can put down in writing, this is what I want to happen. These are my wishes. This is my intent. And I think everybody should have this. Um, you know, at, at some point, you should, you should create something like this so that you could um, try to relieve any burden of the family to have to deal with, with everything else after you're gone. And you can just dictate, this is what I want to happen. This is where I want my stuff to go. This is where I want my body to go. And this is what I want done. These are my last wishes. And um, we saw that happening here in chapter 50. But all the, the grief and the sorrow, and they lamented and they mourned for, for, um, 
for Jacob a long time. So much so, it says... So first he embalmed him. You just go ahead and stay there. I'm just going to read real quick. We already read the whole chapter. Stay in 1 Corinthians 15 because we're going to get to that. And I'm just explaining why I'm going into so much depth. Joseph had his father embalmed right by the Egyptians. And, then, and that took 40 days to do the embalming. And then it says, And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. Seventy days they mourned for Israel. That's a long time of mourning. I mean, that's, that's like, that says the Egyptians. So like there was this widespread mourning going on for Israel. And that shows you what type of man he was. It shows you that he was a man that's respected. I mean, sometimes you'll see these great funeral processions, right, of someone who's had a lot of influence in people's lives. The more people you've had an impact on, obviously the more people are going to grieve and, and, and care that you've passed on. If you don't make an impact on people's life, you know, people probably won't even care that, that you've passed on. I mean, people don't, don't have family and friends and don't know anyone. Oftentimes people die without anyone even recognizing that. And it's sad. But that's not how Israel was. Israel was a man that was respected and a lot of people knew. And they mourned for him for 70 days. And then it says, um, and when the days of his mourning were passed, you know, Joseph talked to Pharaoh or unto the house of Pharaoh and he's basically just asking, hey, let me go. I want to go bury my dad. This is my dad's last wishes. He asked me to, to take him and bury him in this field. You know, let me, let me be relieved from my duties so that I can go and take care of this. And of course, Pharaoh lets him go. You know, he has no problem whatsoever with that. Um, and then it says, and Joseph went up to bury his father and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh the elders of his house and all the elders of the land of Egypt. So the elders of the land of Egypt were the, you know, the people who are respected, the people who are in positions of authority. They all come with him. And they all go out to this funeral procession that they're grieving over Israel. And um, the only, basically the only people who didn't go, he said the little ones and their flocks and herd, you know, they just left a few people back to kind of watch over the house and watch over the kids. But everyone else went up to this, uh, to this funeral and it says there was a very great company. There was a lot of people there. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan. And there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. So now they even mourn for another week, a whole other week. And, and it was such a great, you know, sadness and mourning that even the people, the Canaanites in the land, when they saw it, they, they looked at it and like, wow. This is a big deal. This is more than just your regular funeral. This is, you know, they really are sad about this so much. It says that the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. They named the place. They're like, this is such a big event and this is such a, a you know, a big thing that they're mourning over that they actually named the, the place after what, what they saw was happening there. And, of course, then they bury him and... Um, they bury him in the, in the procession. So all of this grief in the morning is standing out quite a bit in this chapter. And it takes up, like I said, half the chapter is, is just on this whole story of Jacob dying. And then, and then at the end of the chapter, Joseph dies. So covering the, the, the death and then also the resurrection, I think is important to go through these topics. So flip back, if you were, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to see the resurrection because there's nothing wrong with grieving. Like I said, grieving over Israel, hey, they knew that he was a saved man. They knew he was going to see him again. Joseph knew he was going to see him again, for sure, in heaven when he died. But there's still that grief. There's still that, that, that sorrow over losing someone. Losing that man has been around in your life for so long. And for Joseph, it wasn't quite... I mean, he, he was missed a big chunk of his life with his father. But this is the great comfort that we have is in the resurrection of Christ and just knowing this. So when we go through these sad times and in a time where maybe there's extreme grief and sorrow because someone that you really care about and really love and someone that's really close to you is passes on. One, it gives you all the more importance for someone like that to make sure that they're saved so that your mourning doesn't have to be as bad if you happen to survive longer than they do. But for two, we can, we can have this hope then 
of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number 16. He explains, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. He's saying, look, if Jesus didn't rise again from the dead, if he didn't come back to life, girls, sit down and be still. If Jesus didn't come back to life, then what are we doing all this for? He said, our life is vain. He said, we're of all men most miserable because what were they doing? They were being persecuted. They were going around and preaching the gospel. They were, they were suffering. They didn't have a place to stay oftentimes. You know, they, they went through a lot of hardship. He said, look, if the dead don't rise from the dead, if Christ is not raised, then we, we are really not living a very good life at all. He said, we're of, most, of all men most miserable. There's no point in this. And if you don't believe that Christ raised from the dead, if there's no resurrection, then you're yet in your sins. Because Christ had to rise again from the dead in order to, to, to redeem us from our sins. Verse 20 says, But now is Christ risen from the dead. He's like, He is risen from the dead. It's not just a, a questionable thing. He says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. See, He's the first fruits. He, he came first showing us the resurrection, that we have hope in our resurrection that's going to come. Jump to uh, verse number 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming, which is when we'll be going, then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. There's going to be a time when there is no more death. And that's another great thing to look forward to. It's going to be after, um, after the world as we know it. After Jesus Christ comes back, after he sets up that millennial kingdom and the great white throne judgment, finally, when, when death and hell are cast into the lake of fire, there's no more death. What a great day that's going to be. It's the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Jump down to verse 32. The Bible says, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Again, he's going back to saying, look, if there's no resurrection, then what's the point? Why, you know, why did I fight off these beasts and put up with all this hard stuff? Like, why don't we just eat and drink and just, just live our life just to, to be happy and then we can just die? And, and so what? If, the, if that's the case, that there is no resurrection. But there is a resurrection. Jump down to verse 35. He says, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool! That which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. And this is one of the reasons why I believe in that it's a Christian, it is a good thing to do for a Christian to be buried when you die. And I've preached an entire sermon on this before, but... We saw that, that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they bought a place, they bought a plot of land, they bought a cave where they're going to be buried. And, and Jacob dug his own ditch to be buried in. The reason why is because we are showing a picture of, like he says here, that which thou sowest, he's referring to a seed being sown. And in order for a seed to spring up, and you know, it gets sown in the earth, right? It gets buried under a little bit of earth. It gets watered and, and sunlight, it gets fed, and then it grows and it comes back up, right? It dies in the ground. The seed breaks open and dies, and then the new life comes forth up out of the ground. And this is the, the picture when we put, our, put our, um, our dead bodies in the ground. We know that one day that, that the, the, the seed which is our flesh being sown into the ground is going to be raised up and, and with a newness of life, with a new body, a new flesh. This old sinful flesh is going to be changed. 
And we're going to get a brand new flesh, completely different. I mean, a seed that goes in the ground, when the plant springs up, it looks nothing like that seed. It's completely different. It's completely changed. It's a whole new life that comes up. And that's the picture that we're showing when our body gets buried in the ground. He says, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body. He's referring to the body being sown. Thou sowest not that body that shall be. You know, the, 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 the flesh that gets buried, that's not what's coming back up again. He says, But bear grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. Verse number 38, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. We're getting a new body. Verse 39, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. And we're talking about glory. It's the brightness. It's that shining. That's what the glory is. Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. Our corrupt flesh, our corrupt body gets sown in the ground. It is raised in incorruption. We get, a, we get a completely brand new sinless body. It is sown in dishonor, verse 43. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. We are going to have a new spiritual body for our soul and spirit to inhabit for the rest of eternity. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. I mean, he's really laying this out real simply. Just as we, we become, we, we're born into this world in a natural body, in our, in, our, in our human flesh. But when that dies, it gets buried and it's going to be raised up in a spiritual body. Verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So as we are in the likeness of Adam in our physical appearance, and of course Adam was made in the image of God, and we are in the likeness of Adam because we have this physical body, when our spiritual body is raised, that's going to be in the likeness of Christ. The spiritual body will look like Christ's spiritual body. That's raised from that. It's going to look different. I mean, we're still going to have a, you know, a body, but it's, it's not going to be the same. It's a different body. It's a spiritual body. And it's, and it's formed after and fashioned after the image of Jesus Christ. He says, and that's what he's saying in verse 49. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. We're not going to go to heaven in this physical body that we have right now. That's why we need a new body. He says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Hey, we can have hope in death when people die that we love. Hey, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? We know that we're going to be raised again from the dead. We know that we're going to get a new body and we're going to be with Christ forever. Death is not going to gain the victory over us because Christ has gained the victory over death and we are in Christ. And we can share that victory. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
things that we do for God, hey, it's not in vain. He made reference multiple times in this chapter saying, hey, look, you know, we're of all men most miserable. Hey, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then what are we doing? You know, why are we battling with these beasts? Why are we going through these hard times? Why do we suffer persecution? Why do we hunger? Why don't we just eat and live and then just tomorrow we die? Because it's not in vain. Because Christ has overcome death. Christ has conquered death. He has the keys to death and hell. And when we're in Christ, we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's something to be happy about. And that's something that can definitely come for you. When the, when the death of your friend, your loved one, is when, when that person passes on, hey, if they're a believer, death has no power over them. So we don't have to have that type of a sadness. It's okay to grieve the, the, the separation from them for a while. I mean, I wouldn't like to be separated from my wife. or uh, I, I don't really like her. I don't, I don't like to let her go on vacation very much because I don't like being away from her. I like, I like being together with my family. You know, obviously I, I don't just, just keep her like a, in a jail cell or a house or something like that. But I just, I don't like when she goes with the kids and, and she, she's gone recently on vacation and it was terrible for me because I hate being separated from her. But that's not as big of a deal because I say, okay, well, she's coming back next week, right? I know there's an end in sight. I can get through this. And it's a similar thing with death. Now, obviously, it's not just a vacation. You're, you're being separated for a much more extended period of time usually. So it's, it's a much more sad event and your life really changes quite a bit without having that person in your life. But you still have that same sense of saying, yeah, but you know what? One day I'm going to see him again. One day we will be reunited so it still won't be that bad. And that's the comfort and the, and the solace that we can take in the death of a, of a loved one. Let's flip back, if we would, to Genesis chapter 50. And I made mention of this, but I didn't actually point it out in the scripture where I said that Jacob had dug his own grave, basically. Look at verse number five. He says, this is Joseph talking to Pharaoh, trying to, to ask, being asked to leave. My father made me swear, saying, lo, I die, right? This is Jacob saying that he dies. In my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. So we see there that, that he's dug his own grave. He's done all the work for himself and he's laid it out so that his children don't have to deal with that. And you know, honestly, that's what we ought to do is to be able to take care of ourselves and not lay that extra burden. Because these days, especially, you know, there's, there's you know, money that has to be paid. There's a lot of money. That, it's kind of crazy how much is actually involved in, in a funeral and people dying and like taking care of their body and, and getting all that stuff taken care of. And I think that, that as much as is possible, we should try to take care of that stuff for ourselves so that burden isn't laid to somebody else to try to, to, to pay for that when we, um, when we do end up passing away. And, you know, a will will help with that, too, and these last wishes, just like, like Jacob gave unto his son. And he gave his son, these are my wishes. This is what I want you to do. I want you to take me. I want you to bury me here. This is what I want you to do with me. And Joseph, of course, honored that, and all, and all of his children honored that, and they went and did exactly that. But let's, uh, let's keep reading here. Verse number 14, And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. So now they all return. They come back. They had, you know, this, this great period of mourning is, is finally over. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. So now they're getting scared, his brothers. They're kind of thinking that, well, maybe he didn't really do anything to us. After what we've done to him, you know, and, and selling him into slavery and stuff, maybe he just was, was being nice for our father's sake because he loved, you know, he loved Jacob and, and he knew that it would upset Jacob if he took revenge on us and had this big fight. He said, but now that dad's dead, you know, they're all worried about what Joseph's going to do to him. So they come up with this story. They make up this thing. He says um, in verse 16, and they sent a messenger. And so they didn't even come and confront him. They sent a messenger to go and speak to Joseph saying, thy father did command before he died. So they make up another lie. And they're always making up these lies to get themselves out of trouble. I mean, they should just tell the truth. But they make up this lie just like they did to Israel when they're talking about Joseph being dead. They make up this lie to Joseph. And they say, 
Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy servants, of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And it, this grieves Joseph. It makes Joseph sad. Because they obviously don't know him. And they don't understand that he's already forgiven them. He's already gotten past what they've done to him, and now they're just rehashing it again. You know, when you forgive someone, if someone does you wrong, it's not something that you want to be thinking about over and over again, right? If you're able to forgive that person, and you're over it, and let's say it's a serious thing that someone's done to you, you don't want them bringing that back up again and say, you know, oh man, I'm sorry, oh man. You know, just look, do it once, be sorry about it, express that to the person you've done wrong to, and hopefully they can forgive you. And if they forgive you, then it's time to just move on and, 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 and let that go, man. Let it be in the past. Joseph was able to do that, which, of course, it sends him because now he's thinking about what, what they did to him and everything else again, which wasn't even going through his mind. But what I love about this too is that you know, we saw all throughout the Bible here with the life of Joseph how much there's a lot of similarities between and, and foreshadowing of Jesus Christ and he's this picture of Christ. And even with his forgiveness here. And I covered this a little bit in one of the other chapters. It says, And his brethren also went, in verse 18, and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. So they are humbling themselves for sure. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. He's saying, look, I know you guys wanted to do me harm, but God meant it unto good. And this is the whole purpose of, of all of that stuff happening, that God brought me through it every step of the way in order for this to happen. And Joseph's saying, look, I'm over it. I've forgiven you. And that's why he says in verse 21, Now therefore fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly. And he says, look, I'll take care of you. I, I know why. He's like, I know why everything happened. There was a greater purpose for it. And I fulfilled that purpose. I'm not holding you guys. Or I've forgiven you of what you've done that's wrong. And this is the great forgiveness that we can have with God the Father, with, with our sins. The Bible says in, uh, in Hebrews 10, verse 16, the Bible says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. When God forgives us, He forgives and forgets. He doesn't remember it anymore. It's out of His mind. When we go to God, to God... You know, we, we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and we know that we can't, we can't do it ourselves. We need, we need a Savior. We need someone to save us. We want that debt paid for. Hey, once we do that, those sins are gone. God doesn't even remember them anymore. He doesn't think about it. The Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 10, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. God separates us completely from our sins. And that, that is a wonderful forgiveness. That is the model and example of forgiveness that we need to have with other people in our life. A, a, a forgiveness where... When someone does you wrong, you could, you could not only forgive them, but just completely forget about it and just, just wipe it out of your memory, you know? And, and you say, yeah, but I, I don't know if I can do that. Look, you need to do that. If you want to have a forgiveness like Christ, you need to do that. Work on it. Say, I don't know if I can do that. It's, it's, that's the, that is the type of forgiveness and love that God had and the mercy that he had. We see Joseph had that too. I'm sure Joseph wasn't thinking about those things after his dad died. He was sad that his dad died. He didn't want to have any more problems with his brethren. But they brought it up again. Joseph had already gotten past that. And he proves it in, in his words and in, in the things that he said. 
we ought to be able to have that too. I mean, if someone did so much wrong to you or they've sold you into slavery and they wanted to kill you, to have that level of forgiveness, that's, that's where we need to be. And if you don't think you can do that, you need to work on it. You need to soften your heart up a little bit. You need to realize by the, the amount that God has forgiven you and what you're worthy of and, and what you deserve, the punishment that you deserve from God, let that humble yourself to be able to, to express that same type of mercy unto others and to be able to forgive them. Let's keep reading. We're going to finish up this chapter. We're almost done. Verse 22, And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived in 110 years. So Joseph lived quite a long time also, 110 years old. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you. Look at God will surely visit you. He's saying there's no doubt about this. God is going to come back and visit you. And bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you. So he repeats himself again. He wants to make sure you get this through your head. He's 110 years old. Listen, God will come and visit you again. And you shall carry up my bones from hence. So he gives them his last will, saying, Look, God is going to come back, and when he does, I don't want my bones sticking around in Egypt. I want them brought out of this place. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And it's interesting, Moses actually did take his bones some 400 years later. Almost about 400 years they were in Egypt and they were, they were, they were you know, under the bondage. Where, where, uh, you know, Exodus explains this, that, that after Joseph had died and that whole generation and everyone that knew Joseph died, that's when they started to be really put into bondage then by the Egyptians. And um, that's, that's a whole, the whole rest of the story. But um, it says in Exodus 13, 19, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And, and what an amazing thing, you know, with, with Moses going through this time and actually seeing Scripture just being fulfilled and just being a part of that and saying, hey, we need to take Joseph's bones with us because God has visited us and he is delivering us out of their hands and we're going. And they, and they kept that charge that Joseph had laid unto them. Now, the entire book of Genesis, we're finishing up the book of Genesis tonight. The entire book of Genesis is underscored by the men of faith that's found in its chapters. We have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? Joseph. We go through all these stories of these men and they are revered throughout the whole rest of the Bible as men of faith. I mean, think about Abraham is, is the person that, that God chose that he was going to make a nation out of and choose to be you know, his people and, and what, who he was going to use to reveal himself and the prophets he was going to use and, and the, the, the Bible that was going to be written and everything was going to be used through ultimately through Abraham. He was the one that was chosen. What a great man Abraham was, and we read a lot about him. And then all these other people that had this great faith. And, and we preached out of Hebrews 11. If you want to turn there, it's the last place we'll look at tonight. Hebrews chapter 11 is that great faith chapter that we preached out of. And we see there the references to what happened in chapter 49 and 50. Because they had the faith. Uh, verse 21 and 22 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. We saw that in actually chapter 48 when, when, when he blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. And he did that by faith, you know, giving them the blessings of the future. And then verse 22, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. That's something that Joseph did by faith. He hadn't seen it. He didn't know. I mean, he didn't know it was going to be four or some 400 years in the future either. But he knew it was going to happen. He knew that God was going to come because the promises were made unto his fathers. 
The promise was made unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob about the land that they're going to inherit, which wasn't the land of Egypt, which was the Canaanite land, which they did get led into, which God did deliver unto them because God is faithful and God is true to his promise. And isn't it amazing? You know, there's so many people that want to teach you that, oh, people got saved different in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Yet we see here so much reference to faith in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, there are men of extreme faith that trusted in God, that they were pilgrims on this earth, that they, they were sought out a heavenly land, that they were not, their sights were not set on the physical place, but they, they had faith in their Lord, just as Romans 4 says, and Abraham had faith. That if that Abraham, if he, you know, Abraham was not justified by works. He says, for Abraham, we're justified by works, but not before God. In, in, in Romans chapter 4, he's not justified by works before God, but by his faith that he had. So uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great examples of the men of faith in the Bible. Lord, I pray that you would please just comfort us and strengthen us, dear Lord, and, and increase our faith. We have so much more evidence we have so much more to uh, to help out our faith and and having your your entire word here preserved perfectly for us uh, these men in, in the book of Genesis did not have nearly as much as we have, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to use what you've given us and not to waste it and that we know that you expect even more out of us since we do have so much at our disposal, so much knowledge and so much uh, opportunity, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to take advantage of that. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to be strengthened and comforted during our, our times of, of mourning and sorrow and people pass in our lives. And God, I pray that you would please help us also to recognize the urgency of, of giving people the gospel and getting them saved and not to just put things off because we never know the day or the hour that someone might pass and that separation might be eternal, dear Lord. And we don't want that to happen, especially with our friends and our loved ones, dear God. And I pray that you would please just stir up our souls, stir up our spirits and give us that fervent desire to to be able to, to preach your word and to, to tell the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, your Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.